Hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, welcome to our fifth episode of Composers in Quarantine Drinking Cocktails. I'm here with uh, trombonist and composer Nick Finzer, uh, leader of the Nick Finzer Sextet, professor at the University of North Texas, and the owner, founder, and creative director of Outside In Music, uh, which is, as I understand it, more than just a record label that features the up-and-coming artists in the New York City and Los Angeles scene. Uh, so we'll talk about all of that and more. And Nick Finzer, thank you so much for being here with us today. Yeah, thanks, Steven. Glad to be here. My first question for everybody is always, uh, what are you drinking? Well, I, my cocktail of choice is a, is a vodka soda, and Steven was guilting me about the size of this one. But uh, we are in quarantine, so, uh, I, you know, what better time to get started than right now? Cheers to that. <laughs> Um, so yeah, Nick, I, I think that, that you have like such an interesting and, and unique perspective on writing. Um, seeing as you obviously lead your own group, you've had your own group for many years, um, you, you went to Juilliard in New York City, um, and in addition to your, your work as a leader, you've also played in, in many big bands, whether it's you know, Daphnis Prieto, or whether it's leading guest, artist, uh, guest artist, um being a guest artist with a, with a university and playing your own charts, um, mm -hmm. in addition to your writing for small group, which in my opinion is is very much leaning towards <clears throat> a sort of chamber jazz um, vibe uh, in a lot of your your works, especially on on your latest album. Um, so uh, yeah, let's just dive right in and and start okay. talking about some writing. Maybe you can tell us about some stuff off of your latest record and and your your general approach. <laughs> Um, yeah, sure. So the latest record is called Cast of Characters, and I have been had been thinking more about trying to write tunes that had a more of like what you were saying, a chamber jazz kind of feeling to them, because some kind of th compositional through line as a as a, a challenge to myself, and as a kind of mix it up from the last couple of records that had been a little more like here's a jazz tune here's a jazz tune here's a you know i'm putting together a set of music that kind of flowed together but didn't have necessarily any connection to to one another so um my main composition teachers from undergrad were definitely from the brookmeyer maria schneider kind of whatever lineage of of kind of deconstructing ideas and reconstructing them in different ways and so i decided to take a triad pair and a D and a D flat triad pair and uh, just see how many different ways I could put it together. And uh, I know that's a very nerdy and specific thing, but uh, that, 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 that little idea generated the whole album. So it was a kind of a, just like a personal challenge for me. And uh, you know, there's just, I had, as you know, I put out a lot of records and I hear a lot of stuff that comes in and, and so much of it is the same. It's just tunes and people playing. And I love doing that too, but I just wanted to try to make something that had a little bit more. Now this song has a bass clarinet solo because it needs to have a bass clarinet solo and it needs to have this and, and not necessarily just being like, oh, whatever happens, happens and it can be loose and open and trying to be a little bit more um, decisive as a composer. Like, no, it has to be this because I wanted to feel like this and just actually trying to own, I guess, that uh, role of the composer in a small group rather than just like, ah, it's whatever, you know, do whatever you want. So trying to balance those two uh, things in my small group, has, writing in particular, has been a challenge for me, wanting all the uh, players to give all of their input and give all of their personality, but also try to be assertive and create something specific with my, uh, with my music. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the general idea that <laughs> went into the record, but uh, uh, yeah, that's cast of characters. <laughs> right, yeah, that, that idea of being, you know, maybe these aren't the best words, but being so so specific and so more or less like a little bit rigid with your music um, to kind of make sure that the point that you want to get across um, of the piece, you know, the heart and soul of the music, um, right. even though you're not obviously soloing all the time, um, you know, for, for instance, on the bass clarinet solos on, on this record, I know you're featuring Lucas Pino, and Lucas mm -hmm. has such a unique voice on, you know, on the saxophone and on the bass clarinet as well that you want to let Lucas be Lucas, but you also want to let Lucas be Lucas, but help you tell your story. Right. Yeah, it's 
definitely something, I mean, my biggest compositional influence, uh, whether or not it comes through in my music, is probably Duke Ellington. And, you know, the one of the huge part of that, parts of that influence is that writing for people, you know, the writing for players, not just writing for um, bass clarinet or for alto saxophone. It's actually for, you know, someone that has a certain sound, you know. And the more I get into that, the more when I look for subs, I don't even look for necessarily someone that plays the same instrument all the time anymore. Like I just think about, I'm kind of like, well, who could fill that personality, you know, like who, maybe it's actually like a trumpet or maybe it's, yeah, maybe it's not a tenor sax player, you know? Yeah. Well, let's rewind for a second because you also said something super interesting, which is that you based your 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 whole um, album off of the idea of having a D flat and a D major triad pair. Um, <clears throat> so for, for, for people who are listening who maybe don't know what a triad pair is, like a, a triad pair is basically two, two triads grouped together, sometimes from the upper structure of a chord, sometimes just two independent triads. And for people who do know what triad pairs are, then maybe what you're thinking of right now is like Jerry Bergonzi, Michael Brecker, like getting up into those kind of augmented, or I should say just like out, harmonically out um, uh, triad pairs. But, but what you've sure. done is that you've actually taken a triad pair and you use that as the basis for your whole album. And with that information, you were able to provide your bandmates and just the music in general, uh, the landscape uh, to present like the personalities, the stories that you wanted to tell. Um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about how you kind of like, first of all, like why did you use D flat and D major? Or is, is there a reason, it, you know, I don't know, like, you know, they're a chromatic half step away, uh, mm -hmm. but also like, how do you kind of like take those, you know, you, you, you keep using the word personality. Like, how do you, how do you like shift and, and mold rather, how do you mold those triad pairs to insert the personalities of the different characters, mm -hmm. you know, cause, cause cast of characters, like, you know, for people who haven't listened to it yet, right. It's kind of like six vignettes of, yep. of, uh, where, where each song tells the story of, uh, a, a character of, of a person, an imaginary person. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the big thing about that was, I, I mean, I did steal it. I'm not, uh, I'm just like every other composer that just steals stuff. All right. Often, right. Yeah. You know, so what's that quote? I, it's like good composers Swansky, borrow, right? great composers steal. Yeah, exactly. I forget who said <laughs> that. But. Yeah. So I definitely stole it from something. I heard Chick play. I forget what it was on. What was it on? What was I transcribing? Uh, I don't even know. It was like the last chord of something he played. And it was like, it was just, I'm like, what was that? And then when I transcribed it, it was, it was just that, but that those two tries, but in a weird, like, I understood it as those two triads. Mm. I don't know what he thought it was. It was the notes D, F sharp, A, D flat, F and A flat in some yeah. kind of combination. And it's always fascinated me as a brass player, you know, like harmonic series has always fascinated me. Right, for sure. And like, uh, especially as a trombonist. Yeah, so as a trombonist and also playing in the Gil Evans project and hearing like of course. these Gil Evans things with this, these flutes like playing like in a weird key, like really high and it like yeah. splits in in this weird, crazy way. Right. So it's always been kind of interesting. So anyway, so that's where it came from. I was like, oh, that's like a cool idea. Let me see. But the idea with like breaking it apart and putting it back together again is like, you know, that that D flat triad could be on top. The D triad could be on top. Any of the notes could be the bass notes. It could be just the relationship of a half step. There was a, I kept a kind of very loose uh, approach to like, however it could be combined together to just to allow me to create. I really tried to create from the mood and personality first in this case. It's not always the case when I write music, but and I, I, li I kind of like how it happened better. So I think I'll probably stick with that idea. But uh, just thinking about like, oh, when I play this sound, what does it make me think of? You know, what does it remind me of? When I shift it in these ways, can I make it feel romantic or can I make it feel kind of unsettled or the, these different kinds of feelings, you know? And so <clears throat> combining those with what how I know that certain people play, like, you know, Lucas has a kind of an, an ability to um, kind of play with a lot of... Um, in, uh, inflection i guess or a lot of i don't know bending and stuff and on the bass clarinet in particular that not you know it's kind of like in between notes and kind of like very vocal vocally sometimes and so i knew that he could do that and so that certain 
piece. There's one a tune on there called Brutus. And so I was like, all right, he's not going to play over the form. He's just going to play as this kind of counter character to the main idea. Kind of, you know, the it's a, it's a piece about people being two-faced, basically. Be, you know, Brutus. Of course, the, the famous the Caesar. story. Yeah, so, uh, so it's like, you know, the band is on one side and then Lucas is on the other and kind of keep it, having that like duality between these two grooves that kind of come back and forth in the tune. So I don't know, that's kind of how I think about it, grouping like the strengths of certain people and like the sounds that they can create with the idea of that like overall vibe of the tune for lack of a more specific way to put it. I don't know if that answers your question. No, I, you know, actually, I'm not even sure if it answers my question either, but that's so <laughs> cool. Also, it's just, it's just awesome to hear you, you talk about it. I mean, I think that, that you raise an interesting point, which is that like, you're not always having to make music out of music, right? You're able to take a vibe and then you can kind of, for more, for, you know, for lack of better terms, create, um, right that like the context like the whole story you know or the, at least the basis for the story um rather than you know start messing around with an idea and then arrive and say oh you know what this sounds like it's, th <laughs> it's this <laughs> yes i've had that experience too many times that i've accidentally rewrote somebody else's tune right so. <laughs> yeah for sure i mean it kind of brings up an interesting point because i think that when you write with that kind of intention you know even though you might fail on, uh, you know, and of course, like, you know, this, this, I think is just as valid for experienced composers as it is for younger composers. But when you're when you're writing something with that kind of intention behind it, it's, it's highly possible that you will fail. But that's totally okay. Because all that that means is that when you do succeed, that success is completely intentional and not accidental. Right? Yeah, I, I mean, even for this record, I wrote like, 12 or 13 of these characters and there's six six of them around the record so it was like definitely exactly that i was trying not to like judge the process too much and just kind of like here's a possibility here's a possibility here's a possibility here's a thing here's a thing and just kept keep writing and keep writing and keep writing and so then the best ones will you know rise to the top and then the other ones i don't know maybe there'll be something maybe they just sit there right time will tell mm-hmm you never know when you're going to need something. <laughs> <laughs> right. So so tell us a little bit about how you kind of got into writing in the first place. I think that, you know, in this day and age, like, you know, it's just most people, uh, once they reach a certain point in their in their careers or in their development, they, they hear an idea, they write it down, you know, they've written a song, they're a composer, right? But, but to make that shift, that jump from being like a, you know, a, a hobbyist composer, I mean, that's a horrible way to say it. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> by making that shift from, from being like a part-time composer to being a, okay i have my own project like i'm calling the same band every time i'm giving these people opportunities to tell my story in a consistent way like you know that's a jump that i think happens so so i think it's always interesting you know different people from different instruments different backgrounds they have they have each their own perspective. So, so my question for you as a trombonist, you know, you've all, I, I was always jealous of the trombonists. I'll be totally honest because uh, from my perspective, like I was a pianist, I am a pianist. I even still today look in my own band and I see the trombonist sitting in the middle of the band. They can hear what's happening behind them. They can hear what's happening in front of them. And they have this like central, this central like oral space around them. And that's something that I've always been so interested by because some of my favorite composers, you know, Bob Brookmeyer being one of them, okay, arrangers, Nelson Riddle, both of them are amazing trombonists, right. you know? So, so Nick Finzer, my question for you is like, as a trombonist, you know, when did you make that switch? How did you start writing? Like, what was your first piece? Do you remember any of that? Uh, well, I don't know what my first piece was. I know what my first tune was. But uh, I don't know what I don't know where where to draw the distinction between right. those two things. I was but. gonna make a note to ask you about that later. <laughs> I, I don't know if I have a good answer, but I, I feel like there's it's just up to you probably to decide. Yeah, this is something more than just a song. But um, uh, I, the first tunes that I ever that I wrote were like in high school, in the last two years, or definitely my senior year. I started a like a funk fusion band. I had that for a while, and so the, the, I remember writing tunes for that band. That was like my first compositional outlet, <clears throat> and with no real reason other than like 
I didn't know any repertoire, so I had to make up something to play. So we had a group of people, we played some random stuff. I saw that, I remember, as my first composition. But um, I, I think that as you start to learn about jazz history and jazz trombonists in particular, you start to realize that all of them wrote, you know. Um, J.J. Johnson was a prolific L.A. You know, composer in addition to just being a great improviser and... Uh, you know, Curtis Fuller wrote tunes. Slot Hampton wrote a lot. Uh, he wrote. Slot Hampton has an octet, and obviously he did the Dizzy Gillespie big band for a while, and wrote stuff for Maynard. And I think I just I felt like I don't know if it's something about the trombone being in the middle of the band, or we have this like chip on our shoulder that uh, we feel um, we need to do more because we play trombone <laughs> and to be like relevant to the scene. I don't know what what it is, but. Um, I don't know. The trombonists just like tend to want to do that too. I don't know. It has to do with like the sonic range. I mean, yeah, it's like we, our instrument exists and in, it's pretty easy to write for. You know, like the range is pretty nice sounding and like until you get too high and that gets a little awkward. But I don't know. It's just, uh, you, and you pl grow up playing in like trombone ensembles all the time. Like trombone choir was a big part of my life growing up. And so, uh, I got, I mean, I got into writing tunes because I wanted to have a band, basically, and so I started writing tunes. And then during college, I wrote tunes to work on stuff, basically. Uh, mm. I'd be like, oh, I don't understand what melodic minor modes are. I'm going to write some tunes that are melodic minor modes. And then, um, and then when I decided to not have that that fusion band anymore, and I wanted to have like a straight ahead project, then it was like, oh, I need to like write more tunes and. So I started definitely as a tune writer, not a composer, 100%. And then I thought I'd never write for big band and all this kind of stuff. But um, one thing led to another. And I just, um, I don't know, there's something that I think probably most composers can agree with is that when you think so something is just going to sound OK and then it actually sounds really good and you just get hooked on that like feeling of like, oh, wait, I, I came up with that. That sounds pretty good. And I like that. I mean, the opposite is also true. There's plenty of times where you're like, oh, this sucks. The opposite is more true. At least in my case. <laughs> oh, totally for me, too. It's like, oh, that was awful. Okay. <laughs> well, but... Uh, yeah. So, and then as I've gotten older, I've realized how much your improvisational voice and your compositional voice are basically almost the same. They're, they're interlinked in such a way that it really is just like that is your musical personality. And so I have my students get into composing I try to get them into it in order to unlock like what their voice is as an improviser like what do you want to play like they're like because they learn all of the you know repertoire of scales and this and that but I'm like well yeah that's fine but you don't sound like you're playing what you want to play what do you want to play like what do you hear like I don't know it was like f7 I play diminished scale I don't know and I'm like okay that's fine well let's let's like take a step backwards and let's say okay let's write something. And so I, I, sometimes I put them through a sequence of like writing for situations and sometimes I just want them to write a tune. But um, I, I just, I find that they're inextricably linked, you know, the, the com improvisational voice and the composer voice. So, and I just feel like, at least for trombonists, <laughs> the ones that were great composers were also great improvisers. Um, so I don't know, I, there's, there's somehow links together. And uh, so I, I've, I've used them to kind of go back and forth to kind of, work on improvising to extend my technique in my ears so that I can hear more when I'm composing and vice versa. Because I definitely don't hear triad pairs like when I'm improvising. I can't really, even now after recording that whole record and touring the record, I still can't really play all of the little things that I tried to like work out for improvising with those two, that like those six notes, like I, they're, it's like pretty awkward sometimes. And uh, so anyway, I'm still working on it. Right, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Um, I think that's that's so interesting and so true that that one's voice as a as an improviser, <clears throat> as a soloist, is yeah you said it perfectly. It's just inextric inextricably linked um, with with your voice as a composer. Um, that's so interesting too that that you're able to notice. Um, what's that? Is that gin? This is water. Sorry, I had to, I had to um, compliment one for the other. <laughs> you gotta stay hydrated, Stephen. Very important, hydration, totally key. Um, where were we? Yeah, so, 
so so you're so when you're working with students one on one, you're having them write tunes, and then you're sometimes noticing, okay, they're writing very differently. I, maybe I think that they want to sound a different way than they're actually improvising. Mm -hmm. So, what are some other steps to that process? Because I think we're we're starting to go down the road of you know advice for for young composers and also instrumentalists. And so maybe we can even take a, a more specific approach here, and. Um, you know, how, how can how can somebody who who doesn't just want to compose, how can somebody who wants to play and compose kind of unite those two aspects of their musical identity? I've, I've found this to be a helpful sequence. Um, I mean, I may, it might not be helpful for all people, but I found it to be useful. Is that to take them through like a series of things. I mean, I, this is my whole approach to jazz education. Let me just preface it and say is that like, I think that the most specific language is the, you know, bebop language, hard bop language, all this stuff, like 40, 50, 40s, 50s, 60s, mm -hmm. early, early 60s. And so I start there and kind of work outward from there with my students and try to work earlier and later and try to try to get an overview. But so I try to take this kind of approach with composing as well to say like, all right, we're going to take a blues and we're we're, we're going to try to put you into a frame so that you at least have, it's not just like write something, because that can be a little bit um, challenging, daunting, when you're like, it could be anything. and then Right, empty like, bar lines, nothing scarier in the world. So I'm like, all right, no, it's going to be a blues, and I want you to write like r write me a riff blues. And so then I'm like, they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, go figure it out. You know, go find me some riff blues, and then you'll, fig and then you'll know what I mean. And then write like, uh, you know, like a jazz blues, like um, Tenor Madness or something, where it's got like, a phrase that changes with the chords, and then and then and a th the third phrase is a little different, and then I do the same thing. Like, all right, now write me a bird blues. What does that mean? Okay, go investigate that. Blah 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 blah. So there's kind of a sequence of assignments. We do the same thing with rhythm changes, and then we do that with contrafacts over standards. Do a couple, and it starts to get them in the mindset of like, oh, I need to organize my thoughts at least as an improviser. And I find by the time they get through all that, they're starting to at least explore how to apply the sounds that they're learning in improv class or how to apply the sounds that they're learning uh, outside of, you know, whatever they're checking out or we're checking out in our lessons. Um, so I try to take them through that, just kind of a guided sequence before having them just like write anything, just as, because most of my students, like they don't necessarily write jazz tunes or jazz styles. So um, I just ask them to go through something like that. And then we might, if they're interested, might go further, but I find just getting some organization, it, it gives you a light, uh, an insight into their, what's missing. You know, you can be like, oh, you don't know, you don't understand anything about how to use this tool, you know, the diminished scale or whatever, altered scale, whatever the thing might be, it doesn't matter. But you can say like, oh, this person is deficient at understanding how to play through two fives because they can't even write two fives when they have all the time in the world to figure out something cool to play, they can't. Uh, they can't decide, you know, and it also shows about phrasing, like, you know, one of the best master classes I ever saw for about phrasing was with Bob Brookmeyer. He came to Eastman when I was there and uh, he came to our small group and he, all he did was this. He's like, all right, that was terrible. You know, whatever we play, I don't even remember what we played, but he was very, you know, aggressive personality. <laughs> and he would be like, do it again. But when I touch you on the shoulder, stop playing. <laughs> so like we, everybody went around and played again and just, when he would just touch them on the shoulder when he, you know he edited their phrasing and it, it was just so interesting to think about like that you know like i don't know the, like the master of phrasing and he always had an interesting way of phrasing and right it just changes everything and so anyway just uh by doing these compositions you can kind of see into the student's mind like do they have any sense of phrasing yet you know how how can we connect you know, the things that they're learning with the things that they're trying to play and the things they're trying to hear. And at least doing it in a compositional environment helps them to um, put do it out of time and not be overwhelmed, even though they might be overwhelmed anyway. But uh, it gives them a chance at least. And then sometimes from there, we'll go into like writing etudes, you know, about like, oh, if you could write the most killing solo that you can imagine, what would it sound like? You know, stuff like that. Right. Just to try to connect your voice and then and then when they're like, oh, I don't know what to do for a sax solely. And I'm like, well, what would be killing? What would you hear on this that you would want to hear? They're like, well, what do you mean? What am I, aren't I supposed to do something? I'm like, I don't know. Why don't you just write something that you want to hear? And they're like, oh, okay, well, interesting. So anyway, it's more about just like, 
to me, posing questions that they hadn't considered maybe then, uh, and just kind of guiding them through right. it. I think you got to figure it out for yourself. And you have to, if you want to compose, you have to spend a long time just sitting by yourself and kind of figuring some stuff out. Yeah, live alone and like it. Learn, learn to live alone and like it. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Right. Wow. Well, that was awesome, Nick. Um, your, your students are very lucky to have somebody who's so open and, and encouraging of, of them to find their own path. I think that that's an approach that, that educators, that, you know, I think it's so easy actually to teach um, specifics and tools mm -hmm. and be like, oh, saxophone solely? Well, let's check out these double diminished or these passing diminished chords, you know? Yeah. Uh, and without actually like figuring out like what that sounds like, what that feels like to listen to. Because um, mm -hmm. you said it yourself, you got to write what you hear. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously there's resources to be like, well, I don't know how to harmonize this. Then I'll send them like, go check out this book. But you're waiting that, for, for for the questions. You're waiting for it for the for the inspired questions that that the students have arrived at on their own. I need this information. They say you say, yeah. here's where you can get this information. You don't say, OK, well, here's all this information. <laughs> um, now eat it up, you know, good luck. Yeah, good, good luck. luck. See you later. Yeah. <laughs> see you at the see you at the concert. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm.